Bridges, Baldcombe, Hayward Heath, Wibblesfield, Burgess Hill, Hassocks, Preston Park, and Brighton. I would like to start by again saying welcome and thank you for coming to join us today. Um, Alpha and Liza will be explaining what the pop-up research stations are about, but I'm Sandy Holman and I'm the director of the Culture Co-op and United in Unity, and I'm proud to be a partner working with Sojourner African Heritage Museum in Sacramento and, and presenting uh, the presentation that we're going to have today and facilitating the discussion we're going to have today. I want to thank you for joining us on spring break. Most people are on spring break. We were just talking about how this is the week where everyone's on spring break. So I'm excited to have you here with us today, and I hope you um, have fun participating. Great. And again, thank you, Sandy, for being part of the team. Um, first and foremost, I'm Alpha Bruton. I am a um, um, our consultant, but also a research and development consultant for Sojourner Truth African Heritage Museum. And um, through the pop-up research station, which is a platform that myself and Liza have, um, you know, um, we've been doing pop-up research station for at least 13 years. Um, I have the Phantom Gallery Chicago he, um, network here in Chicago, and she'll introduce herself as, you know, with the Phantom Galleries that she ran in LA. We came together and talked about, you know, let's do um, pop up research, let's call around the country, uh, locally, nationally, internationally, and talk to people that are doing the same type of work that we're doing in temporary installation spaces. Um, so, Journey Troop African Heritage Museum is one of my, um, you know, projects. They're also one of my clients, and I work closely with Shona McDaniels, the executive director of the museum as an artist, a muralist, an activist. Um, and um, so this is part of her case study that we're following um, by bringing her and allowing um, um, the, the museum to have this platform. Um, and this is kind of the kickoff of our think tank, you know, on the, that will be held on the first Tuesday of each month. Uh, we meet here at the pop-up research station every Tuesday um, at the same time we've been meeting for the last three years. Um, you know, post COVID, we decided to just start having our cafes online where we're having these conversations with each other live and virtually. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to um, Liza so she can introduce herself as co-founder of Pop-Up Research Station. Thank you, Alpha. My name is Liza Simone, and I run uh, Phantom Galleries LA since 2005, which started in downtown LA and was part of the Gallery Row um, events that uh, sort of transformed downtown LA. And we um, have helped other organizations begin their own pop-up organizations as well and we I currently work as space in the gap and we are utilizing these spaces not only as temporary public art galleries but we have now started having artists co-working space and artists in markets and expanding what we originally started with Phantom Galleries LA and Alpha and I did meet online we had a lot of people contacting us asking us how we produced our program we both started interviewing people around the country, as Alpha mentioned, and we're still together today. And I'm so grateful that everyone is here. I hope you will join us every Monday. And Sandy, we're so happy to have you here. And if uh, Mark or if um, Kathy would like to uh, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself so we can get to know you as well. Thank you for being here. Hi all. I, I don't know why my video keeps cutting out, but it does. But uh, I, I, my name is Mark Miller. I'm actually in in Livermore, California, right now, and uh, I, uh, I just jumped in to provide a little extra tech support for Sandy in case she needed it. And uh, once she gets started, I will probably duck out. But it's very nice to meet everybody. And I am Kathy Marshall. And I go under the name Kanika, the artist name Kanika, since 1993. <laughs> And hi there. And Sandy put out an invitation. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what this was about, and I thought I would just check it out. I had some time today and just see what's going on because I know Alpha also and probably met Alpha and Shona in the 90s. I know yeah, I met yeah, Alpha and in Shona in 95. So we go way back, always a supporter, always um, 
very excited about what they're doing. I am a mixed media sculptor. Um, I particularly like welding oh, I and love clay it. work. That's my my life. That's my love. And so yeah, I'm just I'm just really here as a listener to see what's going on. Kanika, we're so happy to have you. Thank you for joining us on a spring bake break week. I'm just so happy and I'm so glad you're still out there creating beautiful things. I love it. We also have Luca with us today. Hi, Luca. Hi, everyone. Nice to, to see you all and meet you all virtually. Uh, Mark's background reminded me that uh, Mercury is in retrograde and I have a friend who likes keeping track of these things but he says that always is a period when technology is going to be uh extra difficult to navigate even more so than normal yeah. so i don't know if that's any consolation for everyone but maybe it gives us a little extra grace or something yeah um i'm here uh today in my capacity uh with <laughs> i'm here uh my capacity to do with davis repertory theater uh we're uh, based in, in davis california and uh been uh and uh, we're working on a, uh, a piece of um, what some local entities are calling uh, the Hate Free Together Initiative. So we're actually, um, and we actually, as part, part of the sort of artist component of that, uh, had our uh, first um, pop-up research station, I think, uh, last weekend at the farmer's market, where we're beginning conversations about um, uh, how to... Uh, build stronger, more resilient communities. Uh, we're maybe calling our wing of it the, the CARE project. But anyway, uh, we're working, uh, beginning two initiatives um, uh, as as our uh, piece of that. Um, so I can say more about that uh, at, at any point here, but uh, delighted to, to be here with you all, learn about uh, the work that's happening. And uh, I lived in Chicago for 15 years, also Alpha. So oh. anytime I hear someone from Chicago, I always <laughs> want to reminisce about what a great town it is. Oh, but anyway, that's yeah. enough for me yeah. for now. Lucas, I'm I'm so excited that you're joining us. And I'm really excited, obviously, as a Davis resident myself, you know, that our community is also trying to do these efforts. I really think they're really critical. So thank you again for taking time out during spring break week and so forth to join us, because I really think it's critically important. And I'm so glad that you're here today. All right, so um, thank you. Delighted to be here. Rachel um, on the line. Hi, Rachel. Good morning. Um, I am hey, Rachel. How Hi, are you Sandy. <laughs> oh, it's so great to see you. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. It's great to see you too. Good. Um, I'm in Davis also, and I heard about this through an email that Sandy sent out, I believe. Um, I am the arts and culture manager for the city of Davis and work with a lot of community groups here, including um, the project that Lucas is working on right now is a um, part of a large grant that we got through the arts and culture program to explore um, connecting artists with other civic activities going on and other initiatives. Um, and I don't really know what this is. I just, it looked intriguing and I put it on my calendar and here I am. So I'm I'm just curious and I'm happy always to connect and learn about other projects that are going on and how we might connect with them or how we might learn from them. Um, Rachel, I think it's great again that you hear. Um, it's, it's almost like a sister. It's like, almost like a mirror reflection of what we're trying to do here in Davis. Um, Sacramento, as you remember, that grant gave grants to Yolo County, El Dorado, Sacramento, a couple other municipalities, and you guys got one of those grants. And so I'm familiar with both projects intimately, and I think it's really critical to cross-pollinate and learn from each other. And so I'm just happy that, first of all, I'm happy just to see your beautiful face, but I'm happy to have you here in this space. And again, Alpha and Liza, they created this and especially during the time of COVID. So uh, it could go beyond boundaries of a particular city. One thing I like about this is that they send this out all over the country and even to places internationally. It gives artists who are trying to do community engagement, equity and change, uh, the opportunity to engage each other, to learn from each other, to understand what that really means because these projects are important but a lot of people don't really even understand what does it take to create the mind share for the artist to be able to be impactful 
in what they're trying to do. We're sending them out there and some don't really have a vast knowledge of community engagement and so forth. So these opportunities, they are more casual, but we're also going to do a presentation. And today we're focusing on um, how you can use the arts, um, you know, a museum in particular, but really a museum without walls, which we qualify uh, for here in Davis. In May, we'll be looking at um, social justice using the arts. They're all related to what you guys are trying to do. I actually had a good talk with um, Joseph about this. So anyways, um, I'm just ecstatic to see your face today because I, I got about 50 emails from people saying, Sandy, I would be there, but I'm on spring break. So thank you for coming today. My pleasure. And just, um, I'm going to excuse myself a few minutes early because I have an, another appointment right when this ends. So apologies no in advance, but I'll just sneak off. No problem. Great, and, and, and welcome again to all of you that joined us today. And then we're also live streaming this on Facebook. Um, the program that um, Sandy um, is under is the Capital Region Creative Corps, which is a um, grant that was done through the California Arts Council and the Office of Arts and Culture in Sacramento. Um, you know, sent that call out. Um, I responded to that call. And so I'm project managing. And um, this, uh, we call it the Creative uh, Region Creative Corps, and we're focused there on art and tactical urbanism. And um, these are a series of listening sessions that we're doing. We're not only doing them here <clears throat> at Pop Up Research Station, we also have them on Blog Talk Radio, which is another methodology that we use at Pop Up Research Station to collect data. And some of our artists on our creative team have been showing up and having their um, you know, interviews with me, which is real creative conversation, and they're just talking for half an hour. And we call these our listening sessions. Um, what I have the artists do is connect with me once a week, and we call that office hours, because we're focused here at Sojourner Truth <clears throat> under this grant proposal as a media campaign on social justice. And all of the artists that are on our team were selected because of their art and social justice work that they're doing in, in the community and how they show up in the community focused on you know, environmental justice and other issues um, that they take on in their art practice. Um, and, but also we focus on the media campaign and for the first time in Sojourner Truth's history of being in the community since you know 1986, we were able to bring billboards on Florin Road you know, as part of this large media outreach campaign that the museum is doing. And each month we, are, we have a social justice, you know, um, you know uh, our marketing director, Kevin Coleman, uh, has done an excellent job on our branding for this. And uh, our first billboard that went up was for Black Heritage Festival. And here at Sojourner Truth African Heritage Museum, we celebrate Black um, Heritage 365 days of the year. And that is our campaign. Um, and then you'll see another billboard that's going to come up on Florin near Loma Verde as a wayfinding um, to the museum for Earth Day. It's a beautiful piece that is artwork and it's also inspiring us to look at the planet. Um, so we have a series of these that are coming out and we're rolling them out and finding new ways to uh, do our media campaign. Um, in May, all of the artists, including Sandy, are doing workshops and workforce development is part of the, of the grant. So today I'm gonna turn things over to Sandy so she can begin and introduce her presentation. Um, oh, this is uh, number two in a four-part series that um, Sandy is doing as part of her listening session. Um, and, you know, I'm, again, I'm really honored to have you guys all here on this beautiful day when it's sunny outside and it's lovely. I, I want to take a moment always to honor our ancestors and all of those who've come before us in the arts. And in fact, since we're focused on the arts, Thinking of all the artisans from around the globe, from around the world, starting in Africa and traveling out of Africa, because we know Africa is the cradle of civilization, and pollinating the world with artistic um, footprints of their existence and their being. You know, we we understand that it's the artists and their creations that outlive their lives. In other words, we've been able to discover a lot about different cultures by looking at the art they left behind. And even though oftentimes things are credited to Greece as the initial 
progenitor of the arts and, and museums. Actually, the truth is, is that all starts in Africa from the earliest rock paintings that were put on the wall, the hieroglyphics that we see. So today I'm excited because it's an opportunity to learn about museum culture, history, but also how we can use those things to fight hate, which I know Davis is very interested in doing, and also Sojourner Truth Museum, which I'm gonna to refer to as Sojo at this point. Both of these projects were funded by the same source, just so you know. Uh, El Dorado has one, so does another. And I've had the privilege to be familiar actually with, with at least three of those projects. And those projects are designed to equip artists to go out into their communities in their creative ways to basically create social engagement and change. So these discussions, as Alpha was saying, are helping us to cross-pollinate and learn from each other. So I wanna start um, by acknowledging our ancestors, our elders, and then I want to say to you guys again, thank you very, very much for joining us. I'm going to uh, put up a slide uh, PowerPoint here. So again, as Alpha was saying, this is in uh, we're working in partnership with Sojo, a museum for the people. I intentionally call it a museum for the people, and you'll understand why as we talk about that. It's a museum that literally is a museum but it's also a museum without walls. And as we think about these um, fighting hate, promoting equity, promoting social engagement and all of that, we need to expand our concept of a museum without all walls, which is basically empowering artists to go out in their communities and go to where the people are. And I feel like Sojo really represents that well. Um, I entitled this documenting our history through museum culture, but really I could have entitled this, you know, uh, exploring history, impacting social engagement and social justice uh, with museum culture, with educational approaches, with libraries, and so forth, because all of those things are foundational towards that. I'm really, really proud that the Culture Co-op United in Unity has been doing work for almost 40 years in this area. We've learned a lot in working with our collaborators and so forth. And as Alpha said, I'm very privileged and excited to be partnering with them um, on these brilliant community listening sessions. They are designed to be informal, but we are going to have a little structure to this one because I want to share some critical information with you too. So thank you for joining us today. I hope you join us on May the 7th, uh, where we'll be talking about social justice and community engagement, utilizing the arts to lay a foundation for change. I am finding that a lot of people who are doing these projects with well-intentioned meaning really are sending people out into the communities without having very much training and also without having a mind share. There are best practices in social justice and community engagement. In fact, if I was designing the grant that you all have received, part of that grant would be mandatory initial onboarding of a series of workshops and gatherings and discussions on what social justice and community engagement is so that as we sent these artists uh, out into the community, they would even be more optimally effective in the work they're trying to do. So I think that's critical. Um, the other thing is we really are trying to collect data. All of these grants are trying to collect data. And so this is uh, the one, one of the surveys I'm gonna ask you to scan and to do later, it really does help inform future work that Sojo is trying to do, what communities are trying to do, what Davis is trying to do, what people all over the country are trying to do. And I've been privileged to work with some national groups around the arts. They're all trying to do the same thing. And they know that data is critical to creating and doing things that we know are going to be effective. So I want to encourage you to scan this. It's not doesn't take long at all. And if you would be so kind to do it, it would mean the world to us. Um, right now, I'm curious how you are all feeling as we take on these initiatives that have to do um, with change and community engagement and equity and against the backdrop of a crazy chaotic country and community in a lot of respects. So I want to stop for a second and I want to ask you all, uh, how are you feeling? How are you doing um, 
in this moment. I'm trying to stop my share here. I don't see where my little button went, but um, that's what I would like to know is how are you guys all doing? How is it going for you? How are you feeling right now as we, we talk about these kinds of things? So I'm going to ask Rachel if she'd be willing to share first because um, it's just so wonderful to see her and I want to put her on the spot and she won't mind. <laughs> Thanks, Sandy. <laughs> um, that is a really big question. Um, so I'm not sure kind of at what level you're asking, how do I feel? Um, In any way you want to answer that. Yeah, any way. I feel um, part of this grant process of working with California Creative Corps. It, um, I'm feeling like I wish, one of the things you just said to me, um, I just wrote down, you know, like we gathered this group of people together who are really um, skilled theater performers who have various level, and Lucas is one of them, so sorry, I feel like I'm talking a little bit about Lucas also, but um, mm -hmm. I wish that we had had more time in this grant process to be able to do more work up front, like you just mentioned, like really have the opportunity to do different kinds of deep dives so that people went out with more tools in their belt, so to speak. Um, the Because the grant has such an expedited timeline, we, we I finding that we're really cramming things in and having to um, address things that are very important and very complex in really short conversations and I feel like everybody on our team I think is a little bit um you know like feeling like we really wish we had more time that these things these things require more time to go into them completely um I'm finding that the more I learn about history of our of our area of our country of everything the more I learn um and the more I learn about how social justice issues are getting addressed the more that I just realize like what I know is like this big and like a universe of information um so I guess I'm feeling um inspired by the work that we're able to do so far but feeling really like it's kind of inadequate and that there's that the the more that I learn also the bigger I see the problems are mm -hmm. um and the more work I feel like we have to do but really grateful that we got the grant and that I mean we kind of keep telling ourselves on our end we wish we had you know multiple mm -hmm. years to do this project but at least it's starting mm -hmm. um you know it's it's much better that we have one year to do whatever we can do during a year and then have that set the groundwork for hopefully building upon that in the future. Mm -hmm. That's really validating. And I want to assure you, Rachel, that you're not alone. As I speak to some of my colleagues across the country, they're saying similar things, whether their grant is funded by this sort or other grants where they're sort of doing all these incubators of possibility, which is wonderful. It is wonderful. It's exciting, but where they're feeling like they're um, in a crunch and the time frame and, not being able to really strategically plan it out so it can be even more optimal. But I really am um, excited that you guys are doing what you're doing. So thanks for sharing that. Um, let's see, who would like to go next? I, I I made Rachel go first. Who would like to share how they're feeling right now too? And it can be related to the grant or what we're talking about today or just in general. You know, I could, I could take that um, part of the conversation, Sandy, because I'm executing one of the Capital Regional Creative Core grants. And one of the, the my takeaways in this whole process is because we already are doing the work. Um, and um, that's one of the things that Richard Falcon um, said to us when even in the workshops that were they were coming into the communities doing the workshop. It's like you all are already doing this work. You know what I mean? And we um this at, at Sojourner Group African Heritage Museum. Um, we already had the Horn Road Community Beautification Project, which was a huge endeavor that we're doing at the museum. We already have a media campaign in motion. Um, our artists are already activists. Um, so yes, we are already doing the work, you know, mm -hmm. in the field. And the artists that were selected for our team, um, I strategically selected them, not randomly, because of the work that they're doing and put their resumes online. But what my approach to this whole project is to have you give me your work plan. I didn't give you the work plan. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to create the work plan for you. And see, that's where all of us on our on our um, office hours, we go around and around and around because most of the times, 
you know, you're taking on these projects, people are telling you what they want you to do. And my approach was, I need you to tell me what you are going to do, you know? And so basically it's almost writing a grant backwards, you know? Um, but I, I like that flexibility um, in, in not, you know, controlling, but shaping. And so even with the whole marketing plan, all of you were part of putting these surveys together, putting our toolkits together, putting together, you know, this workbook that we're, that we're getting to from the beginning to when we execute these projects, we're putting everything together at the same time. So you have the buy-in for this project. And it's not us as the project managers or, you know, Shona as a director directing you to do this work, you know, so that's been my approach. And we're not, um, what do you call it, reactive, like just kind of reacting to, but this is what like, it just fell right in when we were able to um, come in and partner with the Latino um, Art Center for City of Altars. That's already part of what we were doing leading up to Kwanzaa. So it was on our timeline. I strategically thought about the way Sojourner Truth programs, right? And then I also looked at the climate of what's happening, not only in Sacramento, but nationally you know, and internationally, and our topics have been environmental justice when we came into February, you know, and what's going, and then injustices of what's going on, not only with, with envir the environmental justice issues. So we're building upon that and how we kind of laid out the plan. But um, we, yes, we want more time. A lot of projects, um, I understand throughout the region have not even started because of this whole planning process. And what we, we said we were going to do all of this. So how are we going to do it? You know, and um, again, I didn't create the recreate the wheel. You know, the wheel was already turning. You know, and we're already going on the bus down the street. You know, so that's how we can connect it. We needed a workforce. Shona cannot do all of the work as a director and micromanage all these programs because I'm pitching. We are an agile workforce, right? And we have to have the agility to pivot and change and shape and move. And everyone has to understand that the museum has been in National Academic Youth Corps, has been in the community, you know, 1986, you know, coming into our murals program. But we've only been three years out with the museum in its new expanded space. So we're recreating all these programs and implementing these programs. Um, and uh, we needed a workforce that we're gonna come in and help. And we have a very diverse group of artists that are coming into the, to the museum community. You know, it's an African-American heritage, but they're coming into the community. And like you said, we need to train our workforce, our people that are working with us about who we are. They're learning more and more about, you know, the African-American presence in Sacramento and the African heritage, and they are painting our, our murals. So what can I mean? So that's all I can say about that, you know, and how my approach as the project manager is um, with this project. And I don't think we, we need more time, but we need more money. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm pressing the whole issue. If we need more money, I'm going to show you what we're doing. Yes, we're already doing the work. We're already reacting to these to these issues and building community and shaping community. So we need more money. I don't want to reapply. I want the three hundred thousand. I don't want just the hundred and seventy thousand dollars <laughs> you gave us. You know, I want to to implement this program. I want now the three hundred thousand for me, the museum because we've already proven this work and what we're doing. So in your so case, so what's nice what Alpha's basically <laughs> saying in their case, um, they already had a lot of things happening because, uh, as you guys know, or you don't may not know, uh, their community in the African marketplace and the Sojourner Sojo Museum, as I'm going to call it, have been doing these kinds of activities for quite a while. So this grant just gave them extra glue to bring things together and to be creative. And they're learning even more things than they've already been doing, and also are hoping to get more funding. So I want to um to say that that is always a wonderful thing when you have some of the fundamentals already in place the constructs of the total approach in place and it's a matter of troubleshooting and figuring out and and just making sure people are working together cohesively um uh, i'm wondering if kathy is willing to share or 
Kanika or Miss Marshall, whichever you like to be called. But how are you feeling right now? And again, it doesn't have to be about the grant. It can be about uh, the arts. It can be about just life, anything. Well, this the reason why I was particularly interested in just listening in today is number one, Sandy invited me and she's awesome. Bow down. Um, but when I turned 60 in 2016, I began to get really worried because I've been collecting ancestral information since 1976, right? But I hadn't done anything with all those documents. Think Roots, mm -hmm. if, if you've ever heard of the story yeah. and whatever Roots. And so I jumped in. So I'm, I'm stepping aside a little bit from the visual arts and going into the authoring stuff because I think the ancestors are so important. Sandy, you started this off with an ancestral, right? And so that's where I'm personally very interested in. And the specific reason is because, not to be political, I'm just being real. No. I'm really tired of paying my taxes for my children to go to public school and them not learn anything about women, African Americans, Native Americans, on and on and on. And so this is, what I'm doing now is to try to encourage everybody, write your stories now, write your family stories now. These artists are doing it through a visual means, which is fantastic, bringing in all these different ethnic, ethnic backgrounds. That's what I want to see reflected in the information that our children are taught in schools. Mm -hmm. And so for me right now, I am a diversity and inclusion specialist on behalf of our ancestors. That's what my bio is now. Yes. Because I think it's so important that all groups, I don't care what group you are in, yes. we're all Americans. Yeah. <laughs> we're all Americans. Yeah. And we should be celebrated through all kinds of arts, through all kinds of everything as though it's natural. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be whatever you are, whoever you are, it's okay. And it's okay to celebrate it through whatever means you wish. No. And so that's why this particular uh, listening session was attractive to me is is just whoever is watching out there is to encourage them painting yes ceramics dance yes. writing your family stories yes. writing your own stories yeah how difficult is it for you to accomplish what you need getting grants yes an example of what you're talking about now so that's that's about um where i'm at right now so it's a little it's not solitary because i'm in a lot of groups writing groups yes. that do the same thing black women write Elk Grove artist uh, and excuse me, Elk Grove authors. So that's it. No, and I really Thank appreciate you what you're saying because you're reaffirming the power of the arts across genres, you know, because a lot of times people think literally art is just painting or literally art is just sculpting. No, it includes all of what you just said and beyond. Uh, as a writer, I really appreciate you saying that because writers are artists too, they're recorders of history. And it is critical to tell each and every one of our stories. And today, um, as we talk about uh, what I refer to as museum culture, again, museum beyond the walls, which is basically equipping people to go and do what you're talking about. You know, you refer to it as DEI efforts and exactly I feel every person has a responsibility in the time that we're living in to use their gifts. In this case, since we're focusing on the arts, their arts, at least an aspect of them towards fighting for justice, advocating for equity, advocating for empowerment and creating change makers who feel like they have hope for their environment as we see all these young people plummeting into abyss of hopelessness. So I really appreciate what you say. And I'm really excited to hear you're writing something. You're going to have to tell me more about that later. <laughs> okay. So, um, Lucas, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to share how you're feeling overall. How are you doing? Sure. Thank you, gosh. It's so, I'm so happy to be here listening to the conversation. I guess the short answer first would be affinated. Um, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, good. I, I, um, I I think that along with all of this, uh, everything everybody's talking about, there's there's um, oh just for me we we I, as I said I lived in Chicago for a long time. I worked with a um, organization that's now called Playmakers Lab, and we we were an arts education company and and went into uh, underserved schools uh, and marginalized communities and and made theater with and tried to and. Uh, instill confidence and have students instill confidence in their writing. 
So that's kind of where my, um, oh, I guess, uh, perhaps journey with art as social justice began. Um, and, uh, and so it, it, then we, we, I came here for grad school. So we've been in Davis since, uh, 20, 20, oh gosh, 2015. And so, uh, just constantly, I think I resonate with what Rachel said, where it's like, keep, I, I want to keep asking the question, what, how can the work be of, of, uh, the greatest service now, um, in order to address all of the things everybody's uh, talking about, but I'm, but I'm, we, we got to have our first, uh, one of, one of the initiatives we're working on is an oral history project uh, on the recent, uh, recall McDonald campaign. And so we got to have a group come together and we trained some, uh, a, a group of interviewers where we decided on our, what are our questions going to be for our interviews, uh, and may one day turn that into a kind of Laramie project style performance. Um, but, uh, that was the, that was the beginning, um, the, 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 the first meeting. And so we got to, uh, have just a, co a conversation and really do some processing about, um, thinking about why, why, and how did people want to become involved with that campaign? So for those folks who may not be as familiar with that kind of hyper local, uh, 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 thing that recently happened in, in Woodland. Um, there was someone who was on the school board who started saying transphobic things uh, at um, at at uh, the city council meetings, um, and uh, so they uh, and and started saying things. Well, we don't really need ethnic studies in our schools, and math and science are more important, and this is secondary. And so, so there was a local effort that got started to get enough signatures on the ballot to recall this person. And then uh, that barely, barely made it. Uh, so I was getting all the emails. Oh, we just need, you know, 40 more signatures. <laughs> and people went out in the rain and got the, got the signatures. And then, um, and then it was on the ballot. And then we had to go around it, it, a lot of uh, local folks or a, a small group of dedicated folks went and got those uh, reminded enough people to vote. And then, you know, I think they're certifying the results uh, maybe next week here in the, the, from the California primary. Um, and it passed uh, two to one. It was like 900 yes and 500 no on the recall. So, wow. so this person who uh, was, you know, saying these uh, terrible things, getting talking points from from uh, our local Moms for Liberty chapter, uh, is is has now stepped down. So they're not going to be one of the school board members there. So our project, we're going to go and talk to people who were involved with that effort and 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 um, create an oral history that may one day become a performance. So anyway, that's. That's a bit of one of the one of the initiatives we're working on. And uh, well, that's a significant and, uh, happening, uh, Lucas, because especially if you turn that into performance, because we know the arts often allows us to communicate things that may be difficult for people who aren't open to it and uh, and be more open to it because it's coming to them in a creative way. So that would be quite powerful to see all of this result in some sort of performative art kind of thing that the community could experience as a whole. And congratulations to you uh, for the accomplish accomplishment that you guys uh, had. So um, I'm going to answer that question. Did I get everyone? Liza, did you share how you're feeling? Uh, how are you feeling overall, Liza? This is a cafe and we do have lunch during the cafe and I just took a bite of something to eat. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> my apologies i'm feeling oh. good and hungry oh good and well, you, happy. well good go ahead and eat and Thank feel you. feel fine eating um i want you to know this is how i'm feeling i'm feeling like this is a time to really focus the power of everything positive that we have within us to try and make a difference for our communities for our country and the world i'm feeling like the arts are unique in its capacity to actually go out and make that happen. And especially when people are informed and understand best practices and understand how to work together in solidarity and how to cross pollinate and how to use all of that to have a tremendous impact. I'm feeling like people are desperate for that. They're desperate for expressions of love, empowerment, change, and hope because so many people I'm meeting across the country are absolutely hopeless. 
I'm feeling like time is critical as we are in 2024 and 2025. We know these are pivotal years for a variety of reasons in this country and around the globe. And I'm feeling really excited that all of you in your own capacities, um, you know, it's just been a real honor, for example, for me uh, to work with Alpha and get to know her more and more and to work with, you know, I've always had a tremendous amount of respect for Shona. Rachel, all of you guys who are here today, in some capacity, I have crossed your paths with the exception of maybe one of you. And I'm feeling like there's hope for change. Change is so needed. So I'm going to go forward and talk about a few things. I want to um, to backdrop this, give this some context by saying I did want to focus on museums, museums within walls and out of walls, you know, museum culture, the, the origins of it, because it actually ties uniquely and in an interwoven way with the issues that we are facing around the globe as it pertains to justice and engagement and equity and parity and the sharing of power and resources. The two have traveled a very parallel journey, believe it or not. And that's why utilizing the arts as a part of these grants and way beyond are really critical and make sense. And so um, some of the things are gonna seem random, but they're not that I wanna share with you today. So I'm gonna go back to sharing um, my PowerPoint uh, with you. And again, thank you for sharing how you feel right now. And I know there's a lot to be felt um, and I'm hearing it from people. You know, I was going to ask you to write down one to sentence about what you, uh, how you're feeling, but you shared it verbally and I'm with you. I want you to watch this short video. Um, it's out of the cost of darkness and reflecting on equity. Because when we're talking about the arts, to me, they're married. The arts and equity is married together. So I'd like you to watch this just for a minute. Can you expand your screen, um, Sandy? Uh, so there's a moral reason. So there's a moral reason, which is that everybody deserves um, to have their human dignity acknowledged and, and defended. There's also a really practical reason that this country is, if you look at the demographics, becoming browner and blacker, and at the same time, the, that part of the population that's growing is the part of the population that's most struggling economically and educationally. Um, it's be even beyond educational because it's systems that are existing. They're even outside of your education system, like your economic system. Right now, there's a high correlation between race and a shorter lifespan, uh, less opportunity, uh, less college graduation. Uh, if we can change that. Um, and we want to change it not by making the rest of the society worse off, but making the entire society better off. The problems with the United States Supreme Court's way that it deals with problems of structural racism is that, like so many white Americans, the Supreme Court seems to think that the problems of, of uh, race and racism are pretty much behind us, not completely solved, but they seem to think that um, we have, a, we have overcome most of what we have to overcome, having abolished slavery and having enacted civil rights legislation, and it's now time to move on and deal with other issues. Equity, and again, in communities of color, we talk about racial equity, but I think in the mainstream, it's a scary topic. People don't want to challenge the status quo. There's a whole lot of uh, people, white people, who think the system is just fine the way it is, and that, in fact, we have solved the problem by providing equal opportunity, but they're not really seeing that opportunity is still not equal. So um, that clip is out of a documentary we did called The Cost of Darkness. I want to uh, remind you all that you are welcome to request facilitation. This is something that I would have as a requirement for anyone receiving grants going forward or doing the kind of work that we're all trying to do, utilizing the arts, people understanding uh, some of the history of our institutions and how they work, including museums and the chronicling of the arts in our past from Africa on up today. And so 
Um, I think it's important as we do this work to reflect on equity because what is it gonna take? Honestly, it's gonna take uh, four parallel lines of work and all of that should be based on truth, telling the truth and not being afraid of the truth. I had someone reach out to me and say, we would like to have you come and talk but we don't want you to say anything that's gonna make people uncomfortable. Well, that's not being truthful. And I could not guarantee those people. In fact, I could guarantee you that at some point, if you're being honest and conscious and introspective and showing courage and resiliency, that at times you're gonna be uncomfortable as we do the work that we do. And so I truly believe it's going to take individual work, working on ourselves individually within the capacity of the talents we hold. It's going to take a real basic understanding of equity systems, his, history, and so forth. When people do not have this, it results in their work not being as optimal. That's why I think there are certain things that should be foundational to any DEI effort, to any initiative trying to change or impact social justice, community engagement, and so forth. Your people who are a part of your program actually will appreciate it and feel more equipped to understand why they're doing what they're doing and to do it more effectively from that historical perspective. And then also an overall specialized competency in your chosen discipline. And so each of us, including all of you, have a special area of expertise and you specializing in that area. And then as a part of a mosaic, working with other people who have other talents and competencies makes the work more powerful in a variety of ways. And then last, it takes engagement with real people and implementing what you have learned. That is one thing that I do love about um, the Sojo Project and, and what they're doing. They are constantly engaging with real people who are on the front lines of oppression and suffering and challenge and, and feeling the full impact of what global constructs of supremacy ideology, white supremacy has done to people of color, to LGBTQIA folks, to women and so forth. They understand when you're interacting with real people, not just reading about them, not just uh, going to them to ask them questions, but then they don't benefit from the knowledge you've gained, not just giving them tokenism survey uh, levels of money, minimum wage, while you get thousands of dollars from a grant that's not impacting them. Engaging with real people really changes how it will be. So these four parallel lines of work should be a part of the grants that we're all a part of and beyond. Um, this is Shona. I have a tremendous love for Shona. Um, and I see why so many people love Shona Alpha. I mean, the people around her are extraordinary too that I've met. Um, I really love her heart. She is someone who matches my intensity of what she wants to do, no matter what the cost is. You know, some of you know, I'm dealing with health issues and so forth, but I have not let that stop me from doing the work that I feel like each of us has a responsibility to do. And she really had a respect for Sojourner Truth Museum. I mean, she actually encapsulates the spirit of Sojourner Truth, which is the, you know, obviously a key part of the name of the museum and the effort that she does. Um, it's I a hidden gem in South second. Sacramento. The Sojourner Truth African Heritage Museum sits in the corner of the Florence Square Shopping Center. It's just been so amazing to be able to do this work. Shona McDaniels founded the museum in 1996. Her mission is to change lives through art education. What's special to me is being able to uh, work with youth that are choosing the path of being an artist. Put the glue on here. The museum holds events like this one to inspire the youth, strengthen families, and bring communities together. Okay, that's Henry Box Brown. And then there's Massa Musa. He was a great African king. She says it's also about ensuring representation in the arts. Because I want young black girls, you know, to, when they see my art, be proud to be a black woman. This piece was inspired by my mother and uh, my mother's mother. 
Shona fell in love with art at a young age and remains <laughs> inspired by the story of Sojourner Truth. As a young lady, I used to uh, draw images of Sojourner Truth. Born into slavery, Sojourner Truth tirelessly advocated for the rights of African Americans and women. I want to do something special to honor her legacy. And she did with the creation of the Sojo Museum. It explores the black experience, past and present. The walls of the museum are covered with African American art from paintings to photography, quilts and more. Everything that I share on the canvas is coming from my perspective as a black woman. Shona has contributed to more than 150 murals in Sacramento, Stockton, and San Francisco. It means everything uh, uh, to me because often, you know, black artists are overlooked. There's also been times when I wanted to show my work at galleries in the downtown area. I was told I couldn't show my work because I had these melanated images of black women. So that's what my hope is for more of these powerful images of black people to be in public view. With the museum, Shona is creating space for black artists of all ages to thrive. Being able to celebrate uh, black artists is just an amazing thing and is long overdue. Okay, I'm trying to, let's see, hold on just a second. So uh, I'm trying to stop my share and I don't know where my stop share is right now, but I will just, I will just say this, that um, Shona is a prime example of how you can engage your community in a variety of ways that, yeah, I don't know what's happening with my stop share. So that that little clip that you showed of Shona to me is um, quintessentially what we wanna try to do as we utilize our artists. And that is making them think of art and their efforts and what they do as a fluid process, as opposed to a static process, meaning that it's moving, it's engaging people, it's going places and understanding that historically um, the, that, that, that configuration of using arts in ways that were really colonial, racist, and so forth no longer serve us. And so Sojo is a prime example of, of activism, of social justice, of equity and empowerment in motion. That's what I want you to know about what they're doing. They're doing something that many communities um, are struggling to do. A lot of people are giving lip service to what they're trying to do, but they're not really changing the constructs and the visuals and so forth uh, to show that real change is occurring. And that's one reason why I encourage you to go and learn more about it. I want to go on to this other video, because as we talk about uh, museum culture, I want you to understand a little bit of the history of museums. This is gonna be from mostly a Eurocentric perspective. And then I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, coming from an African diasporic perspective. And I wanna encourage all of you as you're going out there using the arts to understand that you are going to engage more people if they see themselves reflected in the uh, institutions, in the physical representations, in the people that are a part of your team, in your outreach efforts and so forth. Um, which is something that uh, I think Sojo does incredibly, incredibly well. So I'm going to ask you to watch this video. We'll talk a couple of minutes about it. We're going to move rather rapidly because there's a few things I do want to cover with you for sure. But anyone want to make a comment about what they just saw about Shona? How many are you familiar with Shona McDaniels? Just put your hands up if you know who she is. Okay, awesome. Awesome, awesome. We've had the pleasure of having her in uh, Juneteenth here. She's also uh, was at an art display that just ended um, in Woodland at the administrative building. So if you haven't seen her work, it's worth um, going to see her work. But more importantly, if you don't know her heart, her tenacity and her approach, uh, that's I encourage you to learn more about it. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again. 
in the PowerPoint. And bear with me, I am Miss Non-Technical, so I am pretty amazed that so far it's working okay. Um, so proud of you, Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm proud of myself right now because this is, oh boy. Um, so again, African Marketplace takes place on, they're actually there every weekend, but first and third Saturdays um, from about 12 to 6, you can go there and see a variety of things. It really ties in well with the museum, the Sojo Museum, because it is art in practice, you have various artisans selling their wares, clothing, art, jewelry, you have drumming, you have all of that. And it's sort of like a call to go see the museum. It's located at um, 2251 Florin Road. We just celebrated Women's Her Story Month. Um, and, you know, again, this was done by an incredible artist. It's a beautiful thing. We had workshops, and this is, as you're thinking about the initiatives that you're working on, you really want to be doing live, active, interactive kinds of things. That's where you're going to build your following. That's where you're going to build trust, which is critical when so many communities of color and other marginalized communities have been promised things and then left in alert. Doing these events helps them see that you have a commitment toward real change. So this was an incredible event. We had a lot of people there, a lot of fun. We have Earth Day, which is a part of this initiative. And again, these are things that they were doing even before they got the grant. Um, and so they were just able to piggyback on it. That's coming up on April the 13th. I encourage you to come out from 12 to 5, again, at 2251 Florin Road. And um, this is another, this is the billboard that you'll be seeing that Alpha was talking about earlier on Earth Day. Um, I Again, it's just, I, I mean, if this art doesn't grab you, I mean, I could look at this particular image for days. And that's another thing I want to say as we're doing our efforts. If you can do a piece of art, whatever your particular area of art, artist expertise is, without any words, and it speaks to people, that is saying something. Like we could take away Earth Day, we could take away the words, where it's at and everything. And this particular piece would, on many different layers, say a lot of things. What would it say, Sandy? One thing it says to me is, you know, sister girl is crying because she goes, what her face says to me, uh, we need to do something to save the earth. Or what are, what are you guys doing to yourselves, to the earth, to environment? I mean, without the words, this image would say so many things to me. Um, also want to invite you guys um, to come and join us because we use the arts. Mr. Lewis is also a part of this project. And we use the arts, in this case, music and educational narrative to educate people about history and to engage the young people. We're willing to do whatever it takes to connect with them. And I think that's the attitude people have to have. As long as you're not hurting or poisoning someone, what resonates with people? Instead of you, like Alpha mentioned, she asked people to make a work plan so that she they could tell her what they felt could be done. And if you couple that with best practices that are known across groups, then bam, you have it. And by the way, the image on this uh, particular poster, if you look at uh, the iconography, those are art pieces. There are art pieces that had messages from Africa before any European stepped on the continent, before any European museum or westernized museum. These, they were collecting art and they had meaning to their art. And um, you all need to be aware that in most of our world's museums, you are seeing European art or you're seeing stolen art, like 95% of African art is not in Africa. It's in the British Museum, it's in the Louvre, it's in all these other museums around the world, Germany, and they're still trying to get that art, that artwork back. Um, but it goes beyond art. It actually has divine meaning to various cultures. And we need to understand that. Um, history doesn't start with uh, oppressor ideology or uh, co colonial thinking. It starts way before that. And we need to acknowledge our African beginnings. And that's everyone here, regardless of who you are. In fact, I think any narrative out there, any work you're trying to do around the arts, if you're not starting in Africa and bringing it up to the future, 
you're doing a disservice. That's my personal feeling. Um, and that's a whole nother session to talk about. Um, another thing that they're doing is the Banana Festival. This will be taking place on August 17th and the 18th. And I'm showing you how she is using the arts, her and her team are using the arts to engage community as they also fundraise for themselves, have fun, build trust, and all of that. These kinds of things all tied together are important. That sense of Sankofa, return and get it, go back and fetch it. It's so important to learn from our past so we can do the things we know that are gonna help us in the future. And again, that all starts in Africa, which is even distorted on maps um, that we see portrayed today as far as its size. So what I, what I wanna say is we're thinking about museums and we're thinking about museum culture and we're thinking about engagement, community engagement and justice and so forth. You have to know that African art has played a significant role in shaping the culture and history of the world. The belief that Africa is the cradle of civilization, of people kind, is unshakable. Um, the origins of African art, long before recorded history, are preserved in the obscurity of the time. Rock art, yes, and it is art, is centuries old, thousands of years old. And some think it goes beyond 75,000 years old. This is one of the first things that you could say was someone's painting. You could go um, into rocks and caves in Africa and you could see this art. They were depicting how they live. A lot of art we do today depicts how we live. It tells a story. So like we can tell a story about social justice and community engagement and making a difference. But this is some of the first art of the world. It predates even the existence of Europe and Western countries, but this is not acknowledged in a lot of places. So that's why I wanted to just take a moment to call it out now in, in reverence of our ancestors. Why does it matter? Because truth, those four parallel lines, truth in our work is critical towards building trust, acknowledging truth, what's really happened and so forth. This is actual art pieces that were found in Kemet, which the Greeks later changed to uh, the word Egypt. Egypt was called Kemet or Tamari or Sais. These are actual pieces that were taken out of Egypt. They're in museums. If you even went to the Cairo Museum, um, uh, they don't even have most of the art uh, from Africa. You would find that in the British Museum, which has most of the world's stolen pieces of art. Um, again, these are discussions that we need to be happening, talking about as we talk about museum with walls and museum without walls. Can you imagine how validating this is for your community that you're trying to address? Say your African Americans or your Latinx or your LGBTQIA or your women, when you're showing art that reflects who they are and engaging them at that level, it shows a respect and a reverence for who they were and how they existed. This is a game changer in building immediate trust when they see that you know something about who they are. This is why history matters. I want to show this brief. Welcome back to the Accessible Art History YouTube channel. Of museums. For the month of August, I chose to do a theme week all about museums. They are essential institutions that help preserve our past for future generations. For today's video, I'm going to cover the history of museums. Due to the pandemic, many of them are hurting financially. I am hoping that this video will bring awareness to just how important they are for society. The word museum derives from the Greek word Mosion. It means seat of the muses. Back then, museums were not how we think of them today. Instead, they were more like philosophical schools. This tradition continued in Ptolemaic Egypt, where the pharaoh built a museum as a part of the Library of Alexandria complex. Sadly, it was also destroyed by the fire that took so much knowledge from us. It wasn't until the 15th century that we get a bit closer to, to the traditional museum. Lorenzo de' Medici, the great Renaissance patron of Florence, designed the Uffizi as both an office space and as a building to display his massive art collection. However, the term museum was used more in reference to the collection as opposed to the building itself, since it was a multifunctional space. Finally, starting around the 17th century, museums started to get closer to what we imagine today. 
They would have been called cabinets of curiosity and were collections curated by the wealthy. They were made up of art and other items that they found interesting. But in the 19th century, things boomed. All of a sudden, there was a drive to make art and science more accessible to the general population, not just the wealthy. There was a rush to create museums and curate collections. In fact, during this period, 100 institutions opened up in 15 years in Great Britain, and 50 opened up in only five years in Germany. Humanity has been obsessed with collecting beautiful things, well, pretty much since the dawn of time. We can see this in Paleolithic burial sites, and even more famously, the Pyramids of Giza and the burial chamber of King Tutankhamun. Once Christianity hit the scene and began to spread, collections of objects tended to center around relics, religious paintings, and other liturgical items. But in these cases, art was not made for simple decoration. It was made with specific and important purposes in mind. It isn't until the Renaissance that we see the concept of art for art's sake develop. The wealthy of society were able to afford to commission pieces to build their collections up. I talked a bit about this previously when I mentioned the Medici family and the Uffizi, but in fact, the first public art collection was located in Rome. It was the Capitoline Museum, and it was opened by Pope Sixtus IV in 1471. Due to the nature of these collections, it wasn't long before they began to symbolize the national identity. They were an effective way to spread propaganda about a country's history and allow people to be proud of it. Although many institutions were founded with royal collection, there was also an interest in uncovering archaeological sites. This would allow for further connection to the past and an increased pride in nationality. Today, according to the International Council of Museums, there are about 55,000 museums in 202 countries across the world. That is incredible and speaks to humanity's thirst for knowledge and a sense of belonging. This has been helped by the fact that many museums have been working diligently on digitizing their collections. Now, with the pandemic, this has become even more essential to the survival of these institutions. One of the best and accessible ways this has been done is with Google Arts and Culture. It's a site where you can view thousands upon thousands of objects online in impressive detail. I have a whole video on it on my channel, and I've linked it down below and up in the corner. Museums are an essential part of the human experience. They allow us to connect with the past and understand our future. We can understand our cultural accomplishments as well as reflect on changes that need to be made. So um, one of the things I wanted to call out that she did do, um, although she goes over it pretty fast, is she does acknowledge like the pyramids and um, the Library of Alexander. And for those of you who do not know, um, when Alexander the Great uh, conquered Egypt, he went throughout Africa, the interior of Africa included, and collected all the writings, all the papyri, um, artifacts and all kinds of things. And he put them in the Library of Alexandra. It was not knowledge from Europeans that he was collecting. He was collecting the, um, the knowledge and items from Africans and Africans themselves. When that was destroyed, a lot of that went with it. A lot of uh, when, the, when they had the great fire. But she does acknowledge, I mean, essentially the pyramids were tombstones for the pharaohs and they would put all kinds of what we would call artistic pieces, except like what she said, those pieces had meaning for traveling into the afterlife. But these were really some of your first museums in Africa, what we would call a museum today. They did not use the word museum, but again, the art, whether it was iron, whether it was um, you know sculpture, all of those things originated in Africa. And in fact, some of your world's greatest artists uh, were influenced by the styles that come out of Africa. There's interesting research and videos about that too. Um, in most museums around the world, and she did use the word propaganda, most museums around the world are propaganda for the greatness of Western civilization. In fact, even when we went to Africa, 
most of the original African art before Egypt was invaded, before Africa was colonized by Western powers, is kept under the museums. They don't put those things in the museum on the higher levels because they don't want you to know. It's a distortion of history. It's a way to disengage people. They know, just like we're trying to engage communities um, and we're trying to fight for equity and social justice, they know that by keeping people in a form of ignorance, and that doesn't that's not any judgment about the people they're doing it to. In other words, keeping people from their information about who they are, where they came from, is a way to keep them oppressed. You need to understand this as we're doing the work if you don't already. I know most of the people here do. Uh, you know, who controls the information, who controls the art, who controls the narrative and education, who controls the political process, who controls the criminal justice process, who controls all of our major institutions, money, economic, and so forth. That is who controls a community and their ability to survive and thrive. So in other words, if we just send artists out there without the understanding of some of these kinds of compounded institutional impacts, that are having and systems are having on a community, then we're only going to scratch the surface in the impact that we can have. So knowledge is powerful. It's critical. It's important. And, and we got to go beyond that. So I want to challenge you all as you're doing your work. And again, you're, you're not say that you're not doing this to really incorporate historical art um, narratives and storytelling and best practices and the journey of how we got from where we are to today, you know, because museums used to be for the wealthy. Uh, basically, they called them wander rooms or curiosity cabinets. And rich people would collect this art and they would have it in their homes, um, in these cabinets. And again, they were called wonder rooms and they would just have it for their families to look at or when they had special guests. So mostly it was rich white men. Um, who would have these things in their homes. And that's how the art was shared. Eventually, as she talked about, that expanded. And we also kind of combined that with the sense of a live, live quote unquote, freak shows, you know, combining, looking at people who seemed like they were atypical, people with beards, all of that kind of culture combined with traditional museum culture to create sort of this sense of curiosity that could both be um, normal and eccentric at the same time. And I, I think it's important with our artisans, some, some who even have a, a craft that they're practicing and they know nothing about the historical roots of that. It makes me, for example, as I study writers from the past and when I write something for people, understand the impact that I can have on a community, on an effort, on a grant that I'm working on to fight hate, on a grant that I'm working on to increase um, community engagement, it takes me to a deeper level when I understand the historical journey of that thing. Um, I want you to see this video. This bit. is the British Museum. It's the world's largest world history museum, and it draws millions of visitors every year. Inside, it holds more than 8 million cultural and historical artifacts from all over the world, which cover 2 million years of human history. If you follow the museum's recommended list of don't miss items, you'll see its star pieces. Like this Easter Island sculpture that's about a thousand years old, or this bronze sculpture of the Hindu god Shiva. But there's a problem hidden in the museum and we can see an example of it along this route. Out of those 12 pieces, nearly half have disputed ownership. The British Museum claims those pieces belong there, on display for the world to see. But in recent years, many have been fighting to get them back to where they came from. The list of disputed museum treasures keeps on growing. Should cultural artifacts return to their home countries or be left in Western museums? The subject of intense debate as to who should now own them. Let's start with some context. In the late 1600s, the British Empire began expanding across several continents. It became the largest empire in history, controlling about a quarter of the world's land and population. 
During its centuries-long rule, the empire took precious resources and wealth from countries all over the world, including cultural and historical artifacts, many of which ended up here in the British Museum, which was founded in 1753 and kept growing to accommodate all the new pieces in its collection. Lots of the items in the museum were legally acquired and are completely undisputed. Like this one, a 2,000-year-old Roman vase sold to the museum by a duke in 1945. The problem is with the pieces that are disputed. Like the first item you see as soon as you walk in. The Rosetta Stone, taken by British troops from the French in what is now Egypt. Or further in, the Parthenon sculptures, removed from the Acropolis in Athens by a British lord and sent to the British Museum. Or over here, on the floor dedicated to African art, the Benin bronzes, some of the most contentious items in the museum. The Benin bronzes are kind of hard to categorize because they include such a huge range of items from engraved ivory tusks, to brass sculptures, to plaques. But they were all produced here, in the Kingdom of Benin, in present-day Nigeria. This wealthy and industrious kingdom produced thousands of objects and art pieces starting in the 1500s. A lot of the items adorned palace walls and were used for religious rituals, but they weren't just decorative. They were visual archives of the kingdom uh, in a society that did not develop uh, written uh, script as we know them. That's Professor Chika Okekeagulu, an art historian and professor from Nigeria who teaches at Princeton University. They told their history, how they narrated the histories of, the, of kingship of the kingdom, uh, its political and social life. But in 1897, Benin would lose thousands of these cultural pieces. At the time, European colonial powers were expanding south in what was called the Scramble for Africa. They split up the continent into spheres of influence for financial exploitation. All these pink areas were the British ones. Benin, over here, was in Britain's sphere of influence. But the kingdom didn't comply with Britain's trade demands. And in January of 1897, it led to what was called the Benin Disaster, where Benin guards killed seven British emissaries, plus their many guides and servants. In response, 1,200 British troops embarked on a mission called the Benin Punitive Expedition. The British wanted a revenge, but the mission was about more than just that. There were reports of these vast treasures in the palace of the King of Benin, and that if they could retrieve these treasures, uh, sales from it could offset the cost of the invasion. This was all well planned. And so the punitive expedition, in other words, was also an economic enterprise. The British soldiers, armed with machine guns, conquered the city and burned it to the ground, but not before carefully taking thousands of artifacts. They piled them up neatly, photographed them, and even labeled them loot. This photo, taken at the Benin Palace after the raid, shows soldiers with the dismantled plaques that were brought to the British Museum and sold all over the world. And after hundreds of years, the once prosperous kingdom was gone. The region fell under full British colonial control until 1960, when Nigeria, including the city of Benin, gained independence. But even though they were finally free, their historical artifacts were still spread all over the world, locked up in Western institutions like the Leipzig Museum of Ethnology in Germany and the Quai Branly Museum in Paris, and of course, the British Museum. 1995, in London, that was my first time of seeing an original uh, ancient Benin artwork was, yes, at the British Museum. Being in the presence of these magnificent objects and knowing that I had to travel all the way from Nigeria to see for the first time these objects, it was a mixture of pride in the achievement of these ancient artists and anger mixed with a sense of loss at what could have been 
if I only had to travel a few hundred miles. But at this point, you're limited to those uh, privileged like me who could get a visa to travel all the way from Nigeria to England um, to encounter these objects. Most Nigerians will never see them. In March 2000, Benin's royal family. So I'm going to stop that right there. So again, you know, imagine as you're trying to engage your community, maybe you've been assigned to engage the African-American community, or you've been assigned to engage the Latinx community, or the Asian diaspora community, or the LGBTQ. Imagine going in there with an art project with young people, which I've done before, and, and with community members and parents, and not only just showing them the art, but giving them a historical perspective in a way that resonates with them, the power and the interest that that will create in them wanting to do work with you. I want to encourage you to understand that it does make a tremendous, tremendous difference. But also from our perspective, the critical importance of us knowing some of the history and how art has been used as propaganda um, in art that's been stolen and also in art as it's portrayed in negative ways to engage people. So you have to consider who is representing art to a particular community or person or an organization. For example, it probably wouldn't be the best thing for someone of European descent to go and show hot and top Venus, uh, which was uh, many sculptures were done of what was called hot and tot. It's a very uh, pejorative term. Um, which was an African woman who had rather full uh, a rather full backside as you go to engage with youth. So representation as we do our community engagement, as well as the art, as well as some understanding of the prop propaganda that surrounds inequity, injustice, and oppression are really critical for us to be efficient in what we are doing. I want to stop right now and ask you all, what are your thoughts about what you've seen so far? And if you have some questions before I show you the next video, I'm gonna stop share for a second and just come back to everyone. Um, so I'd like to know what any questions or thoughts about what you've seen so far. I was trying to find a way to put you guys on my full screen, but I'm afraid I'll lose everyone. So I'm not gonna even touch it. So who would like to, to start by sharing? What about here? I think I put it on full screen. Do you see us on full screen all for all of us? I do see you all. I just wanted to have you all in my box alpha. It's something I'm doing over here, but I don't want to uh, get us out of those video modes. I'm most concerned about the videos when I put them on. So, right. so what are your thoughts about what 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 I've shared so far? Is it making sense to you? Well, yeah, of course it's making um, sense to us, you know, um, and it, it is really important. I, I was thinking and I just made a little note while you were showing uh, the presentations is how at Sojo, the whole layout and how the museum is curated from the entry coming in, you know, and how that the history is being told from from coming in, you know, um, even though um, Rachel's leaving us now, thank you. Um, I'm so <laughs> disappointed to have to leave this no. conversation. I, I I would love to see the recording to hear the end of it um, and talk um, about it more some other no, time. Rachel, thank you. Great to we see. post this on Pop Up Research Station on YouTube channel. Um, it's also being recorded live right now on Facebook, but um, we'll have a link for you to um, to view this on Pop Up Research Station on YouTube. Great. Thank, Thank you. you Rachel. Thanks so much. Great. So I, the way it, 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 the museum is curated throughout when our guests enter um, and artists enter so that they're learning again the history, you know, of uh, of the African um, heritage. Um, it's not laid out so that you come into these big workshops you know, because uh, we're known more for the mural work, the artwork, you know, that's out in the community. 
that's throughout the um, marketplace uh, there at Florence Square, you know, and people think, you know, because this is an artist run project that, you know, they don't see this part you know, until they come into the museum. So I just made that note, you know, in terms of how it's laid out. And again, it's so important to tell this history, to tell the history, you know, um, and make that part of the lesson plan, you know, and not just paint the image, you know, and uh, do the story, but make sure that your story is connected to the narrative, you know, of the work of the murals that are, are being created. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's one thing I love about the museum and what Shona has done and what all of the people working with her had done is it's it's an experience. It's a live, real experience designed to educate people, to share things with them historically that they may not have known, to enrich the way they're living their lives. And that really is what community justice and community engagement is all about, where people want to come back. Um, I remember people at the women's workshop saying, oh my gosh, Sandy, you've been sending out things forever. And I'm so glad that I finally came. And I definitely have to come back because there's so much to see and take in. And they wanted to, you know, get an official tour. In our community engagement efforts, that history, that knowledge, the workshops and so forth, um, really combined well to, um, you know, bring engagement to the forefront. Um, I'd like to know what other people are thinking. Uh, what um, are you thinking, Queen Kathy Marshall? had her hand up. Can you go? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't see. Who did? Can you go? Uh -huh. You're talking about? Yeah, go. Well, all I know is I am so honored to have the, because you're, Alpha, you're talking about when you just come into the museum and my sculpture is right there before you even come in, that tall sculpture of Sojourner Truth. And I'm so honored that she can be a part of all of it because like Alpha saying, it starts from even before you go in the door and there's so much and it always is changing. You know, there are a lot of, not always, but there are a lot of changes each time. And the room in the back where they have the, the monthly um, artist that is represented. I don't know if um, the barbershop <laughs> show is still up right now. Hair but... story, uh -huh. it's still yeah, up. yeah, hair story, fantastic. That you know, that gosh, when did he first do that? Like twelve years ago or something. Time goes by really fast nowadays. It does. It the does. wonderful honoring of local artists. So the neat thing about being in Sacramento is we have the Crocker Art Museum. I went to the Crocker in 1966 in fourth grade. This is the first time I went. Yeah, it's a great museum. It's the biggest museum, oldest museum, west of the Mississippi. Great, great, great. But where's the black artists in the museum? Yes. Where's the black artists? I went specific and, and they're wonderful and they have done some great things for the African American community. So understand that at the beginning. But one year I went and they said, well, anyone want to go on the tour of the black art we have here in the museum? And I said, yeah, I want to go. There were six pieces in the whole museum, six pieces, and only two were identifiable as black art, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like some of the artists, there's a landscape, anyone can. I don't mean to demean landscapes. I'm just trying to make a point. Only two were identifiable as an African. And so why, when you go to Sojourner Truth Museum, it's all there. Yes. I mean, you are immersed. Yes. There's no question. Yes. And they do such a wonderful job at making it a three-dimensional experience. Um, I like that recently that they, you know, they're doing more workshops in the museum too, because it's like the the actual displays and knowledge combined with breathing teachable moments is a powerful impact. I love it. I agree with you totally. Um, and, and that's a bring school children in. It yes. sounds like yeah. tons of school children and the and the the interns actually these young people. That's just the best thing is creating this. What did you say? The workforce, finding the workforce, the army, the art army of young people and introducing them. You can do this too. And that's where it needs to start as, as early as possible. Yes. So real community engagement, real social justice efforts, real equity initiatives do start early. You are exactly right. And they don't only have people come to their spaces, they leave their spaces like what what they're doing with the beautification project and so many other community projects, going to the schools, Burbank, um, 
MLK Library, all these other places, they go to where the in person is that they're trying to reach is. So you have this nice, beautiful loop of engagement where they're they're pulled into the African marketplace and Sojo Museum and Sojo Museum and all those who are in that African marketplace have the opportunity to be pulled out into those spaces. It's a wonderful, wonderful, powerful thing. And when we're talking about using the arts for change, it's a necess necessity for those kinds of things to happen. Mm -hmm. So um, Lucas, are you still with us? Anyone else would like to share so far about what we're talking about? Anybody else? Yes, Lucas. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I, I uh, took a page out of Liza's book and was uh, frying up a little lunch, also embracing <laughs> embracing the cafe uh, <laughs> aspect of the gathering. I think that the I think that the uh, idea you you brought here, Sandy, of bringing bringing art um, and and the history of the, the true history of art uh, into conversations as we're engaging with communities is 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 terrific um and and so thank you for this and for that and for everything my 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 wife who's the other half of our little theater group is is preparing her presentation and she's going to uh she's meeting with the the black student union at da vinci high school at at noon and she i was you know we were trying to figure out you know how to how to best like what what's the hook how do you have you know students uh become interested in in a, in an original theater making project and i i said well show what you've done before you know that might help but had we had this meeting a, two hours earlier i might have said bring bring in some black art also and and that history so uh anyway i just i feel like i'm gonna keep saying the same thing but thinking about you know what rachel was saying about the uh wishing we had more time and it was like oh two you know i wish this grant could be four years and we could just spend the first year of uh how do we how do we optimize um the the uh our, ourselves first right as as uh community engagers and so uh anyway um I'm, I'm i'll be i'm i'm coming back next time so thank you well i want to say to you, and thank you for sharing that and i want to say even though we don't have four years or two years even you would be amazed at the amount that you guys can still do now with the time that you have left. I think this particular grant ends in September sometime. You yeah. actually can very quickly do some regrouping and reorchestrating re to make sure in that amount of time you're optimizing your efforts and what you're trying to do as you engage community. Um, for example, it doesn't take much to do even just one workshop for all the participants who are involved, one gathering uh, where we discuss some of the very basic foundational things, just that one thing will uptick a little bit their, their knowledge and their approach. Just like you know, you're saying right now, Lucas, this has been helpful to you and I'm really happy to hear that because it's designed to be helpful. Um, um, and if you had maybe heard this earlier, maybe she would have brought in some black art or something like that. That's how quick things can happen. So your being here is a start and a catalyst, which I love, and you'll take information back. What's really critical for us to understand is that because we're often crunched for time, it's really easy for us to leave out essential parts of our efforts because we're trying to meet the requirements of a grant under artificial circumstances, you know, like, you know, grants have their world, their culture of what they're trying to get. And it often it doesn't mesh with the realities of what we're trying to do. And unless you've been doing a lot of this already, like uh, Sojo was doing, it's very difficult because you don't have time to do the onboarding things that I think are critical to make things optimal. But we can do some things still to make it better. So I want to raise my, uh, my hand for a minute, Sandy. Um, oh, go, I'm sorry, I couldn't see it. Go ahead. I, because we all have these thoughts um, running through our head. If we don't say them, we lose them. They go somewhere else, you know. No, go ahead. Um, you know, back, back into long-term memory somewhere. But um, <laughs> just to note, currently, uh, uh, the Crocker Art Museum has an excellent, excellent exhibition now on Black artists in America from the Civil Rights to Bicentennial. And Shona McDaniels was a curator 
uh, of the poetry that went along with this um, installation where she um, um, challenged youth in different writing circles and different high schools um, and the youth that attended uh, that attend Sojourner Truth programming to look at art and choose an art piece that they were going to react to in words and writing. And so they were featured along with this exhibition. Uh, right. So uh, the, the the thing of inclusion um, that um, the Crocker Art Museum does, um, and it's I, I looked at the growth and the development and even when I was there in Sacramento working with them, because you know, I worked with the City uh, Arts Commission at the time, you know, and how they continually try to make sure that they're offering inclusion in their programming. You know, um, I even listed some exhibitions that I went through, Lois Malou um, Jones, the work of, uh, they've done a lot of big exhibitions on black artists over the last 30 years. Um, I know Oliver Jackson is an artist in their collection, even though he does abstract, you know, and then we have to also concern ourselves as you uh, showed us today in terms of the acquisition of art, you know, that we're not pigeonholed in one genre of, of art, in one style of art, you know, and we um, as African-American Black artists, you know, um, in America, we have a cross sector of artists that do abstract work, that do Dadaism, that that are coming Cubism, that you know what I mean, because you know, um, you know, the European artists went into you know Africa and and Picasso, his work is reminiscent of African sculpture when he went and studied, you know, in Africa. So we got to <laughs> look at that parallel of a uh, not pigeonhole African American artists into, you know. Um, like the collections at the Crocker don't resemble what we assume should be black art. Yes, right? you know, absolutely. Um, and I was even in an exhibit curated by Unity um, Lewis, you know, two years ago, you know, at, at the Crocker. So there's cross pollination of, uh, and I'm not just saying this because they might be listening or whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> you know, part of our, we have to understand the work that Shona has been doing and other African-American artists have been doing with the Crocker and coming in and teaching art education and being a resource as well as um, the Crocker being a resource for the museum and referring folks over. And we belong to the Sacramento uh, Alliance of Museums, you know, so, you know, this called SAM. Um, and as one of the only African-American, the first African-American museum in the city of Sacramento, right? So we have to say that, you know, because they are one of our, uh, partners and part of our create, Capital Region Creative Corps is working with cross sector as Sandy and the Culture uh, Co-op is a cross sector uh, organization as well as the artist as a writer that's working with the museum. So I always have to honor and the work that our cross sector partners are doing with us, you know what I mean, to engage us and bring opportunities over to the museum as we share and and encourage everyone to come in and do a field trip. You know, um, Luca, you could have the population that your wife is working with, not only show them black art, but come and have that in, um, in experience by walking through the door, by walking through the um, floor and complex and seeing the uh, 2000 square foot or more murals that the museum has done in terms of arts and business and how the collection of the mural represents the business model that Tom Donaldson, who owns this um, property, African-American owner of this property um, and business incubator and his vision to make sure that he knew that having the arts there and adorning the corridors was bringing in prospective tenants, right? And so in the 90s, when he bought that property, Shona and myself came in and started the murals there at that location. So when you come through the door, not only the door of the museum, but when you come through the door of the marketplace or the important road, you come in and art is there. Murals are there. There's corridors of murals that, the, um, that he has uh, financed uh, for and supported the museum in that way over the years, right? And so um, I encourage uh, um, a field trip and giving folks the information, the location, 
um, in terms of community engagement, um, part of Capital Region Creative Core, and our Floor and Road Community Beautification Project and overall programming is about community engagement. And for Earth Day, um, Sojourner Truth is having a um, Earth Day celebration that will be on uh, April 13th on a Saturday from 12 to 5. And you can come out and we'll have breakout sessions, conversations on environmental justice and um, other uh, projects that are led by art, artists from the, um, uh, the team. And Lucas, um, um, so one thing that I am all for, and this is to just everyone, is, you know, we don't have to work within our boundaries. That cross-pollination of sharing, I've always considered Northern California and the country my home. And so in this case, Yolo County and Sacramento, El Dorado, and the efforts they're doing, all of you guys are within half hour to an hour of each other. And yes, for those students that you're reaching out to, a field trip is definitely a must uh, to 2251 Florin Road to see, it, you know, preferably on the first or third Saturday so you can envision and experience the full African marketplace as well as go to the museum. They, you can arrange a tour because it's absolutely amazing. And that will do more for building trust with you and your wife with this group showing them connected to their own culture and the fact that you take them there, then a billion outreach. A billion yeah, coffees. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Yeah. You took the yeah. word. It, I mean, action is so much more, as we all know, critical uh, than words. And, and this is what this is what is so important to discuss, which is why I'm glad we're having our little mini discussion today, is that there's all these little seeds that we can plant as we talk about fighting hate. I know Davis calls there's the hate free initiative. Um, and what does that really mean? And as we talk about community engagement and social justice and all of that, these seeds that we plant, this cross pollinization, this mosaic of approach, us using each other's best practices and Sojo has a lot of them. And there are things that they can learn from you. Uh, all of that together, makes this effort an effort of solidarity and compounded impact. And that's what we're looking for. So when I, um, again, I could have totally renamed this discussion because we're talking museums without walls, motion and action without walls, as well as museums within walls, as well as that mosaic that's ideal for us to envision. So I know we only have a little bit more time, so I want to show a couple more uh, snippets of videos with you guys and and in with the bang but lucas also i'm here to answer any questions you know i i live in yolo county um i do a lot of work nationally and beyond getting you guys sometimes to coordinate with me is the, a big challenge i just have to say I, i'm just like okay you know so um but i am here to do whatever i can we have a lot and beyond me we have a lot of uh people of color uh, other marginalized groups that are here who could be of a tremendous help in this with the four months that you have left. So I want to encourage yeah. that. So I'm going to Thank go. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you so much, both of you, Sandy and Alpha. And I think, you know, I'm thinking about the, the way that our grant got laid out as the kind of reach outs and then listening sessions and then, and then actions. And, and we're really, you know, working on kind of reimagining a lot of that. So I'm like, this field trip should be an action, you know, like that's, that's what it, that's what it is. And so I, I just re again, continually reassessing how to, how to make it work, as you said, Sandy, that the grant has its own language and parameters and what makes the most sense for what, what we're trying to do. So th thank you both so much. No, you're welcome. And, and more importantly, you know, think about this, like, even if you didn't have the grant, I mean, like one thing I do appreciate about Shona and Alpha and all the other partners, a lot of whom I had already met in other capacities, is when you're out there already trying to cobble together and do this work. I mean, in other words, it goes beyond the fact that you're just incentivized by some money, although we all need the money and we acknowledge that. When you're doing this work from an intrinsic place, because you know it needs to be done, especially in the times that we're living in, your commitment is there whether you have money or not. In other words, I challenge anyone who's not going to continue to do this work if they don't get another grant. That lets me know that your, your work is only grant driven. Uh, we all should be thinking as we do this kind of work, how to survive it, whether we have the monies or not. And Sojo 
that's what they were doing way before. Shona was doing this work when no one would support her. And trust me, I had a few discussions with her. It would be very frustrating. She was not getting the support. Other artistic organizations were getting buildings and money and so forth. But she was committed to doing it irrespective of what she was getting from city municipalities or other groups and so forth. Eventually, they've come around. And it's and it's been a tremendous partnership, a tremendous marriage. So, But all of us need to be thinking about how do we make an impact whether I have a dime or not? Because sustainability, money's going to come and money's going to go. How do you keep... And, and, and that's the main question, Sandy, when the grant writers are reading, you know, um, and, you know, and ranking these applications. They really look for sustainability. How will this program, you know, our project continue after the grant funding is exhausted? And you're right. They look at how you are programming, not based on the grant, but based on how it is being shaped as part of your overall, de you know, development of your programming at your organization. Yeah. So I'm gonna, we're gonna look at your video because we're gonna run out of running up to the hour, uh, oh. and I have a list of um, cross sector partners that I wanted to acknowledge in terms of grants um, th that were granted uh, through the Capital Region Creative Core for our region, you know, which was um, $3,957,000 was spent just on our region with this creative core, which is not only in this area, but it's also throughout the state of California. There's other, um, you know, um, creative cores, Los Angeles County, you know, and different down in the Fresno region, uh, of the central San Joaquin Valley that were funded this money. But the, the, uh, the capital region, received the $39 million. Well, $3,957,000. Yes, and um, so what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm actually, because of our time, I'm, I'm not going to show you a lot of things. I'm just going to say, this particular group of people, Dr. Janetta Cole, um, the secretary, Lonnie Bunch, and uh, Lori, uh, for, for God, I, I slaughter her name, they all got together after George Floyd was killed to talk about how museums were a part of the problem in propagandizing uh, racism and so forth. Um, and I just wanted to mention them to you very quickly. Uh, it's a video worth watching because they did a session. And, and as we talk about sustainability with things, um, remembering the fact that all these people, as after Floyd happened, they put money toward the arts, they put money toward DEI positions, they put money toward all these different things. And so much of that is going away as the heat of the George Floyd incident has kind of gone back to the background. And so that's why I want to challenge everyone to think sustainably speaking. But I do want to show the African Marketplace video with the Sojo Museum. that only take a couple minutes um, uh, Alpha, if I can, just to show yes. that. So let me go back to the share um, really quick. And, you know, hopefully if you join us at some other time, I'll I'll be able to uh, maybe circle back and show. So that's what that was. Um, I'm going to go past. This, the exhibition, this woman all power here to was giving examples. I just very quickly want to show you a snippet of how the Jim Crow Museum I started collecting racist objects when I was a teenager, um, and the stuff was everywhere. At a certain point, the Jim Crow Museum also has made itself a living experience uh, for people to learn about history and to counter the propaganda that's often put forward in our arts and in museums in general. And I'm going to, um, uh, it won't let me go. Point, I ended up with thousands of pieces. I, I didn't know I, what I would do with on, Let me see if it. It's not going forward. I'm trying to go to my next slide and it won't let me go. I have a little clip I wanted to show you with Shona and the museum. Please let me go. Hold on. Uh, this is important. Let me stop share for a second. Let me share again because I'm going to whiz through this. You're doing great. Yeah, it, it won't let me. Oh, there it is. Okay. So I want you to see the Marketplace. Lucas, when you go, the African marketplace happens in the uh, foreign arts complex. It 
It's not just a museum, it's also a space for community. A space to gather, but so much more. You can support local businesses. So there's this, um, this community here that is, you know, we're supporting one another. We were awarded the Smudge Shine Award, which allowed for us to expand from the 850 square feet into 2,500 square feet. With our new expansion, we were able to include the Door of No Return. We have the Henry Box Brown installation. We have the Dunlap Room. Literally every corner I turn, like there's something that, you know, some information or something that blows me away. But I'd have to start when you first walk in, the installation from the artist Lee McCormick. Southern tree. I feel like it was one of the best pieces of work that I've done thus far. And uh, it's really a privilege and honor for it to happen here. Every night I was like, after a whole month plus doing it, you're like living the experience too. You know, it felt like I was kind of like on the ship or trying to figure out how people could survive something like that. I don't know if I could. I don't know how I would have handled it, you know. Black body swinging in the southern. So I'm just going to give you a teaser of that because of our time. Um, I'm trying to go to the next slide because I want to just show you. Uh, okay, this is the heritage exhibit that they have up there right now, and I encourage you to go by and look at that. Um, Again, they're doing the Strength in Our Community initiative where they're working with the community. This is going outside of the museum, Museum in Motion, uh, workshops again in the museum. And here are some of the exquisite pieces of Shona's work. Um, this alone should make you want to run out there and take a look at things. I just want to show you this is, I mean, the space is a totally engaging space and the work is incredible. And Lucas, your young people, uh, the BSU, would totally connect with this. But for all the rest of us, it's just a reminder of the power of art. She has murals and the museum set up to take a journey from Africa to current times. Again, I'm just flying through this really quickly because of time. But it is an, an interactive thing. On uh, every third Friday, they do after school art activities. Um, they were doing a dad uh, painting fatherhood. project. Yes, fatherhood, thank you. The fatherhood project where they had people coming in and painting together, um, bringing people together. This is the chair. Right now they're actually putting chairs along Florin Road. Again, this is taking things out into the community for people to see this is what we need to be doing. Hate Free needs to be doing it. All the other, we need to go, go into the community so that communities can benefit from that. So museums within walls and outside of walls can do all kinds of things to fight inequality, poverty, hate, intolerance, discrimination, and challenge these things using the arts because they build a sense of community identity when we do that and a gathering point for people. They bridge generational and cultural divides. How do you engage people in a museum? Make museum visits interactive. Take your museum to the community and your art approaches to the community. Get people to follow and engage your museum. Promote membership benefits, guest speakers, and so forth. Um, great marketing ideals, field trips, your website, hosts, your phone, using everything we can, and I'm rushing through this to do it. So I'm going to end this by saying to all of you that like this beautiful art piece that you can go see in the Cairo Museum of something thousands of years ago, um, King Tut with one of his wives at the time, arts are lasting. Our work is lasting when we leave it in our particular disciplines and we intrinsically do it because we know it can make a difference whether we're going to get funding or not. In other words, attending to life is an act of love and the arts do it better than anybody when we choose to rise to that level. 
So I'm sorry I had to rush through that because of time, but I wanted to leave Alpha time. And Lucas, I want to thank you for coming. Queen Marshall, I want to thank you for coming, all of you who are coming today. And I'm going to uh, turn it back over to um, Alpha to close things up. And thank you for the opportunity to have this listening session. I hope you join us next first Tuesday in May for using the arts for social justice change. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sandy. I really appreciate your presentation. And, um, you know, it was so engaging. Um, and the work and the research that you put um, together, um, you know, on this project. And uh, we will be um, loading this up and putting it on our YouTube channel. It's part of the archives. And then you can share this out. You can pollinate it out. And then you can invite, again, um, I mean, research, Lucas, as you know, there's people that look at research and run the other way <laughs> because it's they, they fear that what research is. But for us, research is telling our story, talking about the work we do as creatives, um, and just giving everyone a platform to be able to talk about the work that they're doing. And again, we're so appreciative for um, Sandy you know, to prepare this uh, presentation and and uh, and to come on board as one of our uh, creative core um, artists as well as a cross sector partner. Um, I did mention that I'm going to list the other organizations in the capital region that were funded um, along with Sojourner Truth African Heritage Museum. It would be 916 Inc. American River Conservancy, Arts and Culture El Dorado, Arts Benicia Board from Creative Collective. Capital Storytelling, Community Responsive Education, Departmental Disability Service Organization, Freedom Bound Soul Collective, Girls Rock Sacramento, Hidden Temple Media, Justice to Jobs Coalition, KVIE, Latino Center for the Arts and Culture, National Academic Youth Corps, See the Elephants, Sugar School Art Walk, Vallejo Community Arts Foundation, Wellspring Women's Center, YOLO uh, Soul Collective, Yours, Minds, and Ours Collective, um, the ones that receive the larger grants, um, you know, um, that will do more deeper outreach is the 3.0 Studio T Arts Entertainment Center for uh, Land-Based Learning, City of Davis Arts and Cultural Affairs, New Art um, Education, Single Springs Band of Miwok Indians. And those are the our capital region um, organizations, our partners um, that we are um, having a um, professional development, um, as Sandy mentioned, um, you know, for onboarding and things like that, but um, Richard Falcon is hosting a series of professional development for all of the art organizations under um, Creative Region Capital Corps that we are a part of, and our team encouraged to um, attend the virtual workshop. So again, thank you all for joining us on our public think tank with Creative, um, with our, um, where am I at in the world today? <laughs> Pop up the registration. So thank you again uh, for joining us. Yeah. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Happy holidays.